Life is about opportunities. And the decisions that you make when you're presented with those opportunities. Clearly, the defendant had a rough childhood. Mama was on crack, had unstable home life. But that does not excuse, <coughs> that does not justify the decisions that he made the first weekend of January 2007. His very own sister had that same rough life. She had that same mama who was on dope. She had that same mama who was not able to provide her with a stable, stable home life. <coughs> and what did her, his sister make of the opportunities that were presented to her in her life? She didn't finish school. She went and got a GED. She didn't let that stop her. She still made something of herself. She got her job working in a veterinarian clinic. She didn't just sit back and say, oh, because I come from a bad background, my past is who I am. She made something of her life. Same thing with his, his uncle, Mr. Wilbur. He had a rough life. He didn't finish school. He had dope problems. He didn't let that define him. He took responsibility for his life. He took advantage of the opportunities that were given to him. He went to the military. He went to the army. He made something of his life. He had dope problems. He didn't let that get him down. He didn't just say, oh my goodness, I've got dope problems. I've relapsed and I can't do anything. And that justifies all the bad decisions that I make for the rest of my life. He didn't do that. The defendant had more opportunities than either of those two. Because yes, he had a bad life, a rough life. But at age 16, he was given something that the other two didn't have. And that was two families that cared about him. The Rays, Mr. and Mrs. Ray, starting at age 16, the defendant had a stable home life. He had parents who didn't do dope. Parents that cared about him. He had a male role model in his life. He didn't have to work. All he had to do was go to school and do the right thing. And then at age 17, he got even even a greater opportunity. He got moved into a middle class lifestyle. Big house, five bedrooms, a little brother. Parents, they gave him everything. <coughs> he had to work, went to private school. Just obey the rules, Mr. Davidson. Don't have dope in the house. Just obey the rules. Don't ever say that you were never given a chance because when you come to live here, you'll be given that chance. And what did he do with that opportunity? Violated the rules. Wanted to make his own decisions. Brought dope in the house. What did the Rudds do? Did they kick him out? No. Gave him another chance. I understand, Mr. Davis, you got a, had a rough background. I understand why you violated the rules. Give you another chance. What does he do again when he gets another opportunity? Breaks the rules again. They send him back to live with the Rays. And again, these folks don't give up on him. It's not like they say, listen, forget it. You violated the rules. That's it. Cutting my losses. Don't care about you anymore. Don't contact me. They still stayed in contact with him. <coughs> they still supported him. So he's living with the Rays. He's got this man, Mr. Brumley, that supports him, that invites him to his wedding. And what does he do? What does he do with that opportunity? He shows them all when he goes out and commits an aggravated robbery. And he goes to the penitentiary. And while he's sitting in the penitentiary for six years, these folks, they still don't, don't, don't leave him. They're still there with him. They're still supporting him. Sending him money, sending him letters, calling him, taking his phone calls, visiting him. They don't leave him. They still give him the opportunities that other people in his life didn't have. And then when it comes time for parole, what happens? Miss Ray goes to the parole board. She goes to the parole hearing and speaks on his behalf. Listen, my husband can't be here. He's down there helping some other people down Hurricane Katrina. My husband's got a business, and the defendant can have all the work that he wants. And what does he do with that opportunity, ladies and gentlemen? In the summer of 2006, what does he do with that opportunity? Works there for a little while until he wants to make his own choices. And he comes to Knoxville to sell dope. To sell dope.
to sell dope. He knows that the problems dope has on people's lives. He's experienced it. And now he's out selling it. And the same opportunities that he's had his entire life continued that weekend in January 2007. While Chris is there bound, gagged, blindfolded, with two bullets in his back, paralyzed, he had the opportunity to walk away. He had everything that Chris owned. He had his shoes, his, his cap, his girlfriend. He <coughs> had everything that Chris could possibly have with the exception of Chris's life, with the exception of Chris's knowledge of who his attacker was. That's all Chris had, was the knowledge of who his attackers were, the love of his family, that promise that he had made to his mama. That's all Chris had, and the defendant took that. And it didn't end there. The opportunities for the defendant continued across the street with Miss Christian, whose freedom had been taken by the defendant, whose boyfriend had been taken by the defendant, whose body had been taken by the defendant. The only thing that she had left was her life <clears throat> and the knowledge of who her attacker was, the knowledge of who the attacker of her boyfriend was. And it was something, I don't know what it was, it was something about the defendant that that caused Miss Christian to, to believe him. I guess the same thing that Miss Rudd saw when she saw the defendant at that basketball game. There was something about it. When she posed that question to him, am I going to live? I don't want to die. A good liar doesn't tell you that the sky is green. There's a little bit of truth mixed in that statement that he gave. It's full of lies. It's a little bit of truth. Am I going to live? I don't want to die. He had everything that this young lady could possibly have. There was absolutely no reason to take her life. None whatsoever. And he took it. And the only reason, ladies and gentlemen, that he took her life was because of what she knew. Again, back to the statement. What does he say in the statement? He knew that she was not going to live because she came in the house with no blindfold on. She could identify anybody. The last two weeks, you've heard evidence, you know, the law. <coughs> there are eight aggravating factors that we have proven to you uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. We ask you to find that. Uh, we ask you to consider that the mitigating uh, circumstances. Um, however, ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't matter how bad your background is. Just because when you were two or eight and your mama smoking crack, that does not excuse the decisions that you make when you're 26. When you decide to take the lives of two kids for no reason. 